Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Senior Director of Physician Engagement at the MAVEN Project, and I welcome you to the Direct Relief Education Series. This is a monthly series on a variety of topics for the primary care provider. And today launches um, our series for this year with the first one being patient-centered communication skills, the four habits model. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Scott Abramson. Dr. Abramson retired from Northern California Kaiser Permanente after practicing neurology for over 40 years. He attended medical school at the University of Georgia in Augusta and did his residency in neurology and neurophysiology at Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. For over 25 years, Dr. Abramson has been passionately involved in the communication and physician wellness projects at Kaiser Permanente, where he served on the regional board of physicians for these endeavors. He has delivered dozens of workshops and coached scores of physicians and staff. He has written and developed programs on time management, teamwork, difficult conversations, physician to patient communication, physician to physician communication, and staff to physician and provider communication. It has been a pleasure for Maven Project to partner with Direct Relief, and I'd like to briefly tell you about our two organizations. Maven Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one on one mentoring, and medical education sessions. And if you have any interest in learning more to see whether Maven Project can support your clinic, to please reach out to us. Direct Relief is a humanitarian organization committed to improving the health and lives of people affected by poverty and emergencies, delivering life-saving medical resources throughout the U.S. and world to communities in need, without regard to politics, religion, or ability to pay. Please mark your calendars for the following Direct Relief sponsored and partnered talks. So on Wednesday, April 26th at 9 a.m. Pacific is Hypertension Update of 2023. On Wednesday, May 10th at 9 uh, Pacific is the Long COVID with Dr. Gold. And then on Friday, May 19th um, at 9 Pacific is the Vaseline Healing Project Dermatology Series with Dr. Okoye on dermatologic signs of internal disease. And then we have many more that come up as well, and I'll um, put those in the chat um, earlier and, and later. So this talk by Dr. Abramson today, The Four Habits of Communication, uh, is one of my favorite talks. And this is normally given as a... Um, could be like a day-long seminar. Um, and with Maven Project, we often break it up into four different sessions. And he's condensing it into a one-hour session for you all. Um, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Abramson. Uh, thank you, Jill. And uh, it is a privilege to be a volunteer for, for Maven and also really a privilege to uh, be speaking with the direct relief uh, clinics and uh, supported by them because this organization I, I've learned has done a, a, a lot of good around the world. So, and as Jill said, this is usually, you know, given in a, at least a two hour session, four hour session, sometimes half a day, sometimes all day. So we're, so we, so we did condense it, but I really believe that I can give you some uh, um, suggestions about how to improve, improve communication. So um, let's see. So I like this, I like this bumper sticker. Because the thing is, if you were to, if you were to talk to, uh, and I've done this before, is, is you see a doctor-patient interaction or a nurse-patient interaction, and then you interview each one. You interview the doctor, a nurse practitioner, and, you, and how did it go? I said, wow, it went great. It went really good. I I I did a good history. I did a good exam. I came up with a diagnosis. I gave patients some educational material. It was really good. I, I, I wish I would have been videotaped doing it. And then you talk to the patient and the patient says, I didn't understand a word the doctor said. Um, so let me ask you this. Let's say you have two doctors, two nurses, whatever. They see the same patient. They do the same history. They get the same information. They do the same exam. They may come to the same diagnosis. They Now, what if one of those clinicians 
has a little bit better bedside manner. So what? What difference does it make? I mean, they both come up with the same diagnosis and the same treatment. Think about that for a second. And I'm going to give, think about that for about 20 seconds and just write down, if you have some pencil paper, you know, why, what difference does it make? Think about it. Yeah. So I would bet that most of you said something about it. it, it the patient will have a better outcome. Like they'll, they'll like you. They'll trust because if they like you, they'll trust you more. If they trust you more, they'll follow your advice. If they follow your advice, they're probably going to have a better outcome. So I, I would bet that most of you wrote something about that. And um, I'll tell you, I, um, I had, when I was, and I, I was very passionately involved in the communication effort at Kaiser Permanente when I was there. And I had an epiphany about this one day when I first got into it. And what happened is I saw this, this little lady was on my schedule, very sweet, nice lady, you know, with a bonnet and, you know, just, you know, she and her husband called each other mama and papa, that kind of person. So I'd sent her about a month before, I'd sent her to a surgeon and I'd expected that she's going to be coming back. She's on my schedule. I say, this is going to, you know, this will be an easy one. You know, it'll be five minutes. She'll say, Dr. Abramson, thank you for sending me to the surgeon. You know, uh, maybe if I was lucky, I'd get some, you know, little old lady brownies or something. But um, so she comes back and she says to me these words. She says, I wouldn't let that surgeon touch me with a 10 foot laser beam. And then what she said next really stunned me because it was the incongruity of this sweet little lady and what the words she said next. And what she said next was, I wouldn't let that, that doctor touch me. He touched me with a 10 foot laser beam. He was one pompous little prick. Those were her words. And the thing is, is that I know this surgeon and she was right. You know, personality wise, that's, kind of what he is. But he's a brilliant surgeon. He's got great hands. I've talked to nurses in the operating room said, man, he's got the great, he sews them up, does great. But the point is, with all of his brilliance, all of his skills, he couldn't help this woman. And it's the same thing with us. I mean, if they don't like us, if they don't trust us, they're not going to, they're not going to take the blood pressure medicines. They're not going to get the colonoscopy that we recommend. I wonder how many of you said that the value of communication was clinician outcome. And I'll tell you something, you know, as Jill said, I worked at Kaiser for over 40 years. And the first 20 years, I was just a regular kind of find it, fix it doc. You know, that was, that was what I did. I was competent and, and it was all right. It was good. But in the last 20 years, I, I became involved in this communication mission. And I started using some of the techniques and strategies of this communication. And, and I can tell you this, if I hadn't done that, I would have retired a lot earlier because using these techniques brought a lot of, of meaning and joy into my, into my medical practice. Uh, if there's anything else that you thought of, uh, why don't you chat that in and we can do that at the end. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna have to, you know, sort of go through things and I won't be able to answer the chats as they come in. But if there was anything else, just chat that in, I'd like to know. Um, so here's the, uh, here's the approach. This is the Kaiser approach. This is what we use at Maven. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You invest in the beginning, you get the patient perspective, you express empathy, and you invest in the end. And uh, I mean, there are other models of this, but they're basically all the same things. There's nothing really special about this. So we're going to talk about habit one, invest in the beginning. And we're going to talk about three things. One is just the basics, how to establish rapport. Then we're going to talk about investing in your exam room and your homepage and investing in your staff. So think about in the next 20 or 30 seconds, think about what you might do. What do you do in that first minute or two to establish rapport, to build trust, to build connection? And just write down as many things as you do. And 
Um, here are some of the things that, that people have said in the past. I bet you probably said, smile, you know, shake hands. I, you know, in the COVID situation, I don't know. But, but sit down, you know, it makes a big difference. Introduce yourself and your role. Ask the patient how they'd like to be addressed. Acknowledge family members. Uh, apologize for being late. You know, um, I had a, when my, when my, um, when my son was in uh, grammar school, he had a new principal. The principal came from another part of the country. He turns out he, uh, uh, you know, took this job and he became a Kaiser member. And he said to me one day, because he knew I worked at Kaiser. And he says, you know, he says, I went to your, I went to your facility and I had to wait for 45 minutes to see a doctor. And he says, that's okay. He says, I understand doctors are running late. You know, things happen. But the doctor didn't even have the decency to apologize. He said, you know, my time is valuable too. Explain the use of the computer and manage it up. You know, we all complain about the computer, but I, I have a colleague who does this. It's, he does a great thing. A patient comes in, he's sitting by the computer and, and he says, look, let me show you this computer. This is so great. I love this computer. I'm going to pick up, I'm going to show your x-rays right here, right on the x-ray. Look at this. I'm going to show you all your lab work. This is such a great innovation for, for me helping you. So uh, make a social statement and show that you're familiar with the patient history. If there's anything else that, that, that you've written down, I'd really like to hear it. Maybe we can talk about it at the end. Here's something that somebody came up with a while ago is, how many of you thank the ride giver? You know, the ride giver, th these ride givers are like the, the heroes of, of America. Uh, they will, you know, take their elderly neighbor in, they, they, they find parking, they walk them to the clinic, they wait in the clinic for 30 minutes and they go down and get the lab, wait for an hour, wait for the x-ray, get the medicine. I mean, they spent a half a day in the hospital with their neighbor. It's just a, it's a wonderful, I mean, I don't even know my neighbors and these people do these kind of things. Um, so let's, let's just talk about this social statement because I think that's so important and it's so simple to do. So here's a typical thing that, that would happen. You know, good morning, Esther, glad you come in today, but first tell me about Luis's first birthday party. Yeah. Oh, it's so nice, Nurse Patty. The whole family was there. That little boy is so smart. You know, uh, oh, Nurse P uh, Patty, he's, he's so, by the way, everybody, uh, every little the little child or baby is so smart. I mean, you, you ever hear anybody say, uh, guy, he's just kind of average, uh, you know. Uh, anyway, so the nurse practitioner, Patty, goes, he's so cute. Look at those big brown eyes. You're such a proud grandma. Now, everything went okay. Blood pressures were filled, advice on diet and so forth. Later that day, now Esther is at the senior citizen bingo game with friends Teresa and Lupe. Here's their conversation. I have the nicest nurse practitioner, Nurse Patty, so sweet. You know how I love to eat? Well, Nurse Patty talked to me about my diet. I just ordered that low fat cookbook, she said. Uh, you know, Dr. X was my doctor for years and he was always getting on my case about, I, I know he's a good doctor. He's really smart, but I really like Nurse Patty. So which, cl which clinician, Dr. Newby, well, or Esther, I'm sorry, you know, I got the wrong thing, or, or brilliant Dr. X was more likely to change dietary habits. Why? And that's a rhetorical question, right? So let's talk about, so we've talked about just establishing rapport, investing in your exam room and your homepage. A lot of us don't take the time to do this. So who are these, who are these ladies talking about? They are talking about you. They're talking about their visit to the doctor, the visit to the nurse. I mean, that's a big part of their lives. And when they're having this conversation, they're not saying things like, oh, wow, you know, you, you, should, you, 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 should, you should know about the way my doctor can feel a spleen. Oh, my God. The, you know, he's the diploma from Johns Hopkins. They're not saying stuff like that. They're saying stuff like, oh, my... My, my physician assistant has the cutest little twins. Oh boy, that's what they're talking about. I mean, this is your typical exam room. I mean, I've been in a lot of exam rooms like that, but this is an exam room. One of my colleagues when I was at Kaiser, Dr. John Malone, he was a Navy flight surgeon and on his bulletin board, when you walk into his exam room and wait for him, you see all these airplanes and he was in the Navy and all this. So he walks into the room 
And people may have been waiting for five or 10 minutes, but all of a sudden they go, hey, Dr. Malone, my son was in the Navy. Dr. Malone, I used to fly. You know, it's this instant connection. It's a, it's the building of instant trust. And he didn't do anything. He didn't spend any time doing it. Just put up a thing on his boat board. You know, my wife, uh, my wife, when we moved to a, a new town in the peninsula, my wife uh, had to see a new doctor and get a new doctor. And, and she goes to the doctor in Redwood City and she, there's nothing wrong with her. She was doing, she was doing really good. And, but she comes home and she says, what a nice doctor, what a nice man. And like, there was nothing wrong. She wasn't sick. And so I'm in the communication stuff business. And I was, I was, you know, what, what the heck did this guy do? And so I started grilling my wife and she's going, what a nice man. What a nice man. And I, you know, I kept, I kept interrogating her. And finally she says, what a nice man. What a lovely wife. What adorable children. And basically all the guy did was put a picture of his family in the, in the exam room. Uh, simple thing. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and so um, so I started to do that, too, and it didn't quite work out. No, that's not really the thing. No, but this is my family. These were my, my two boys when they were young. Um, but see, here's the thing. What did I just do now? So all of a sudden, you know, I, I mean, I'm not just some, you know, retired old geezer giving a lecture to you guys. All of a sudden, I've tried to humanize myself. And these are my, you know, and these were my, my two sons when they were very young, kind of cute. And you're thinking, you know, God, you know, he's an old geezer, but hey, this is kind of humanized the guy. So I, I don't know, the DNA tests haven't come back yet, but still. So we talked about the... Um, exam room, I want to talk about home pages. Now, um, I think most people, most places, they have something called a home page. And if a patient is going to visit you, they can look at it on the internet or they can, or they, or they, when they register, they're given a piece of paper. And most of this stuff is just, just so boilerplate, you know, blah, blah, blah. I went to this place and this place and you can email me and then you have a personal part and it says oh you know my dog bowser i like to eat healthy and boy isn't this wonderful so i have a colleague and this is i love this home page because this is her home page when people come to see her this is what they get and she says i, I learned from my father that even in the hell of war can result in good. My father and many others moved from North to South Korea during the Korean War. Most of these people lived in poverty and disease in South Korea. However, my father turned the hell and loneliness of war into a positive, caring situation. He always volunteered himself and our family to help. We would cook meals and wash laundry and clean for people of the Korea, especially the elderly. In the end, my father's generosity to others influenced me to become a doctor, just as my father turned the hell of war into something good. I've tried to make a difference as a doctor my father inspired me to be. So if you're a patient and you read this, this is a, this is the homepage of Jenny Cho, one of my colleagues. And what are you what are you thinking about the doctor you're going to see? Is this going to build connection and trust and and uh, ultimately a better outcome? So now we're going to talk just about, we talked about the basics, investing in your exam and your home exam room and your homepage now about investing in your staff. So scenario one. So Josh registers to see Dr. X. He's kind of nervous about this. He'd never seen Dr. X before. You know, I'm supposed to see, you know, this is my first visit. I've been having these headaches. I, I'm kind of nervous. I was just wondering, you know, um, just have a seat over there, sir. The doctor will be with you shortly, just doing her job. But let's see scenario two. Same question. Hey, hello, Josh. I've worked with Dr. X a long time. He's a very nice man. You will like him. Or suppose Dr. X is not such a nice man. Suppose he's seen Dr. Grumpy. Well, I've worked with Dr. Grumpy a long time. He may seem a little serious, but he's very experienced. He will take good care of you. You know, I mean, all, all Grumpy has to do is just crack a smile. He's exceeded expectations. Or suppose he's a new clinician, not very experienced. Um, um, uh, or suppose suppose um, he's not very experienced. You know, he's one of our new physicians. He's up to date on all the latest. Bottom line, you can always say something positive. 
but in which scenario, one or two, will connection be made? So here's a question for you to think about, maybe after the visit. How do you establish the good rapport with your staff? How do you personally invest in them? Something to think about maybe after the, after the lecture. Okay, habit two, giving patient perspective. And I gotta tell you, in, in, the, in the work that I did and, and the way it affected my career, this, this habit itself, I think was the most impactful in my life. It really brought so much joy and meaning into my interactions with patients. So first of all, I'm gonna tell you what it's not and then what it is. So it's not find it and fix it. It's not find it and fix it. It's not something like this. What brings you in today? Well, I'm having a cough. You do your questions and medical history. How long have you had it? Bloody mucus, blah, 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 blah. And then you do the examination. You order the appropriate test. You make a diagnosis, give a treatment. That's not getting patient perspective. That's just find it and fixing it. Here's what it is. Version one. What brings you in today? I've been having a cough. But now here's what the doc does. Before I ask you more specifics, let me ask you, what do you think? What do you think is causing the cough? Well, maybe it's allergies. The pollen's bad this time of year. Okay, maybe. Here's version two. Uh, let, me, let me ask you, how does the cough affect your life? How does this cough affect your life? Well, it's, you know, I soccer practice. You know, I'm team mom. Uh, let's try version three. And before you ask any, okay, is there anything else you fear this cough could be? What do you fear the most about this? Well, you know, in my younger years, I was a pretty heavy smoker uh, and, you know, lung cancer runs in the family, um, you know, back of my mind. So here's some, here's some suggestions about questions you can ask. What do you, what do you think is causing the problem? What's the main way it affects your life? And what do you fear the most? And now that, that the doctor's got this crucial information, um, he, he knows that the patient believes it's due to allergy. He needs to frame the treatment and the, and the goal of getting her back to pro soccer practice. And it's important to reassure her that the cough is not, cough is not lung cancer. So, the value of getting patient perspective. This is the value of getting patient. It's patient outcome. It's patient outcome. She's going to leave there feeling better. Gee, it's not cancer. You know, um, she's going to leave there feeling better. Wow. The, um, uh, yeah, here's a way. The doctor gave me some advice on getting back to soccer practice. And what's the clinician outcome? Why is it, why is it valuable to him? Well, if you're the clinician, not only have you treated the thing with allergy stuff or whatever, and you know, you're going to feel somewhat good about that, but man, you had the opportunity to reassure someone that they don't have cancer. Isn't that a great, isn't that, that should make you happy. It may, it, that can make you happy the rest of the day. I really, yeah, the cough and the allergies, are, that's pretty good, but man, I, I reassured someone that they don't have cough, that they don't have cancer. Maybe she, who knows, maybe she was lying awake at night some nights thinking about that. You never know. Here's, here's the bottom line of this. And really, if, if I could say one thing, this is the, the next slide, I think we'll, we'll, we'll say one thing that I've learned from all of this communication, this is it. Here's the heart of getting patient perspective. It's not about what's the matter. It's about what matters. What matters? It matters that she needs to go back to soccer practice. It matters that she needs reassurance about that, that it's not cancer. Okay. Um, let's talk about expressing empathy, habit number three. Now, you're going to hear two scenarios. In the first scenario, it's pretty straightforward. Find it and fix it. And I want you to think about these things as, as we go. Will making an empathic statement improve communication? Will it improve patient outcome? Will it improve clinician outcome? Does it save time? So let's see. Here's scenario one. Uh, hey, I don't understand why you can't get my kid in. It's, I'm up all night with him coughing. He's got to get to school the next day. I'm not leaving here. 
you've probably heard this before. I'm not leaving here till we get some medicine for Junior. Listen, Bob. I just explained to you how most infections are viral and not bacterial. And I told you about the research in the pediatric journal showing antibiotics could be hardened, blah, blah, blah. And here are the findings of that journal. Five minutes later, I still don't get it, doc. Junior's sick. He needs the penicillin. By the way, doc, what's the name of your chief? Okay, Bob. Let me tell you about the Mayo Clinic data. Maybe this will convince you that antibiotics, and you know, explains, takes time to explain the Mayo Clinic stuff. All right, let's try scenario two. Okay, I'm not leaving here till we get medicines. Oh my, being up all night with Junior? Wow, that's gotta be tough, Bob. Yeah, sure is, Doc. Since Patty left and filed for divorce, it's been real hard for me and the kids. I'm I'm just beat. Oh, gosh. Raising kids on your own, going through divorce. I can't imagine how hard that is for you. Yeah, Doc. It's been real tough. Ah, um, maybe the doctor's just going to be quiet and let this simmer. By the way, Doc, it's been so tough. Thanks for listening. Who's your chief? Thanks for the compliment, Bob. Let's get, can we get back to the antibody question? Sure thing, Doc. Okay. So in this scenario, when you expressed empathy, did it improve patient outcome? Well, I'd propose to you it did because now you didn't give a worthless antibiotic or a harmful antibiotic to someone like this who had probably had a viral infection. So that probably did improve, but did it enhance clinician satisfaction? I mean, in the first scenario, you're sitting there, you know, toe to toe with this guy, you're arguing about the antibiotics. And the last one, you know, you made a real human connection with someone. You know, you gave him empathy about the situation he's in. I mean, if I were if I were in that situation, I walked out of the exam room, I'd be feeling good. I'd be feeling, you know, I really connected with somebody. He needed to hear someone give him a, you know, pat on the shoulder, or empathic statement. Did it save time? You know, you look at all the time you spend going through the pediatric journal, the Mayo Clinic reports. All you had to do was just make an empathic statement and he's on the program. So how do we make empathic statements? So I'm gonna we're gonna I'm gonna suggest some different categories of empathic statements. All right, these are some unhelpful types, right? The one upsmanship we always do that. My kid had a cough, and my kid was out of school for two weeks. You know, my life was, and she took the kids. All right, the one upsmanship empathy, the silver lining empathy. You know, well at least it could have been a rheumatic fever. You know, but now you'll meet a decent woman. You know. Too bad Patty left, but, you know, so, the, you know, the worst thing, the worst thing you ever hear this is when, when um, a woman has a miscarriage and someone says, oh, that's, you're, you're young, you can have more children. Gosh. Um, anyway, here's some helpful types of empathy statements. So I'm going to give you the empathy statement and, and think a second. And what strategy do these empathy statements represent? And I'm sure you use them all the time. Bob, anyone would feel beat going through what you are. What kind of strategy is used there? Think about it. It's one more, think about, you know, one or two words. You know, that's kind of normalized things, right? We make empathetic statements like that. My son had the same darn cough. It was really tough being up with him all night. What's the strategy there? Self-disclosure. These are all good things. We can work this out together. I'm with you, Bob. What's the strategy? You know, partner, uh, in spite of everything, Bob, you're doing the best you can. What's the strategy? Yeah, compliment empathy. Now, here is, uh, and here's another very helpful technique to do. You know, you just reflect back what you what you see or hear. You seem worried. You sound frightened. You look sad. Now, this is what I really, this is the thing about empathy that I really wanted to, to try to 
uh, speak about. And this is the biggest pitfall in expressing empathy. The biggest pitfall that, and and I can tell you that 98% of doctors, because I because I sit in on a lot of coaching sessions and I see this all the time, but this is this is what all docs and clinicians do. Okay. We make, we make an empathy statement and then a fix-it statement. Wow, must be tough, Bob. Let me write a school note for Junior. How about an antidepressant? It'd help you sleep too, Bob. See, there's a fix-it statement. Must be tough. Um, so, uh, must be tough. I think, fam you know, we're going to fix it, right? With family therapy. Um, uh, trying to turn off this phone. Okay. So, wow, you know, wow, must be tough. I know we're, we're always trying to fix stuff, right? It must be tough. I'll fix it. Blah, blah, blah. But so the biggest pitfall is the empathy statement we make and then a fix it statement. Doesn't work a lot of times or it doesn't work as well. Here's the thing empathy statement and shut up. Now, this has nothing to do, with, this is why I hate acronyms, but it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, Second Amendment rights and all that stuff. The reason I hate acronyms is because nobody remembers acronyms. But I have this acronym. This is the only one I've ever remembered. It's called WAIT, W-A-I-T. It's the power of the pause. And this works in medical stuff and even in your personal life. The power of the pause. Why am I talking? And I say that to myself so many times throughout the day. And especially the best time you can say it is when you're ready, when you've made an empathic statement, you're ready to do a fix-it statement. Why am I talking? Okay, the power of the pause, wait. So here's how it works. We just saw it, right? Wow, that must be tough. Yeah, all this has been so tough, so tough. Doc, thanks so much for listening. By the way, who's your chief? I want to let them know what a great guy you are. So is there power in, in empathy statements? Um, now, when you, I'm going to show you a video. You've probably seen this before. But when you watch it, ask these questions. Was this gentleman effective? And the second question to ask yourself, was this gentleman genuine? All right, let's see. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head it is not about the nail are you sure because i mean i'll bet if we got that out of there stop trying to fix it no i'm not trying to fix it i'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing you always do this you always try to fix things when what i really need is for you to just listen no, see i don't think that is what you need i think what you need is to get the nail see you're out. not even listening now okay fine i will listen fine it's just sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just do okay. Was the, was this thing? I mean, we we're not going to be able to relate to each other. But was this gentleman effective? You know, he was. I mean, he he had it. I, I was going to say he had it nailed, but at the end, but you know, until he blew it. But he was effective. It worked. Was he genuine? And I think most of us would say he was not totally genuine. But the but the lesson is that the expression of empathy is so powerful that even an ungenuine expression of it can be effective. And I know people will, will say, well, you know, that's not me. I'm not, you know, it's, um, 
it's it's not me it's not natural it's not genuine it's not it's not authentic it's not natural um but you know body odor is natural i mean but we take showers and we put on fresh clothes and we use deodorant uh, all we're saying is just put a little old spice on your communication and the real and the thing is that it what is genuine is your desire to connect with someone, to heal someone. And if making a, you know, kind of a how's your day type of uh, expression, if that in your heart, the, the genuine thing is to connect with someone, to build trust. And that's there. Even if the wording may be, you know. Okay. So here's a, uh, this I don't know if you, uh, if you have ever seen this this movie uh, called The Doctor with William Hurt, 1999. It's the greatest greatest physician movie uh, that I think has ever been made. And uh, so watch this. This is a short clip from it, and think to yourself: What empathic statements could the doctor have made? Hi, how are we doing? Okay. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. Busy day. Are we looking after you? Yes, thank you. Good. Have you been sore? A little sore, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's healed fine. Let's just get those staples out. Doctor, uh, my husband, uh, he's a good man, and he... I think he's a little nervous. Will this scar always be so? Tell your husband you look like a Playboy centerfold. You have the staple marks to prove it. <laughs> so, so think about, you know, just for just for a few seconds, what what empathic statements could you have made there? Now, here's something um, that yeah, I think is going to be controversial. Is there a downside to empathy? So let's see what happens when Ms. Fetch visits Dr. Impact. Oh, doctor, it's so good to see you again. I know this is a 24th visit in the last six months, but you know that constipation I've been telling you about, I'm just not regular. Sometimes I miss a day or two. He says he's going to divorce me if I keep on complaining about this. And I know, doctor, you've run all the tests and you said everything is fine. But Dr. Empath, I am just not regular. Now, Dr. Empath's thinking, this is what he's thinking to himself. I've seen this woman two dozen times for her doggone constipation. Each time I try to patiently reassure and make some sort of empathic statement like they tell us to do from Dr. Charm School training. But I've had. I'm 35 minutes behind. I've got three patients waiting for me. I've got to attend a mandatory staff meeting on improving our member service scores in 25 minutes. He's boiling over with frustration. Here's what he says. Ms. Kvetch, if I hear one more word about your constipation, I personally will visit your assisted living residence and personally will administer a high colonic. Now, later that day, Dr. Empath goes home. How was your day, honey? Not good. I'm feeling terrible. I went off on old Miss Fetch today, but I, I couldn't take it anymore. I was running late as always, three urgent morning workers, 14 emails, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. I went into this profession because I really cared about people and I believed I truly was a compassionate person. But lots of times I feel like I've got no compassion to give. I'm, I'm becoming afraid I'm turning into someone I thought I would never be. What happened to that idealistic guy in medical school who wanted to show compassion? All those who sought my healing. You know, so these are the seeds of burnout. And what is burnout? You know, a lot of, I've heard the definition that burnout is moral injury. And what is moral injury? I think moral injury, the best definition I've heard is when our actions don't match our values when our actions don't match our values. So here's, 
So here's Dr. Empath and his value is to be kind and compassionate and give an empathic statement to every patient. And yet his actions can't match that value. And that is a, that's the seed of moral injury and that's the seed of burnout. So think about this. And I bet you, I would bet that most of you have either had those feelings or someone went to you with those feelings and confided them in you. And if you were a colleague, how would you counsel Dr. Empath? Think about that. Take it home with you. Okay, let's do invest in the end. Now, this is the one skill, the one skill above all the others that is necessary for investing in the end. What do you think it is? What do you think that skill is? And it's a skill that, again, when I watch patient, when I watch doctor patient interactions, I see it lacking so often. What do you think? There's so many things we do and invest in the end. You know, we shake hands, we give educational material. Uh, let's show. Let, let me show you what it is. Um, here's our typical thing. So, we, Maria, we've discussed your back problem. Everything looked good. I'm pleased to tell you this is all musculoskeletal. Let's prescribe some anti-inflammatory pills and send you to physical therapy and maybe some traction, maybe some acupuncture. Maria, Dr. Stan, whoops. Okay, so the Dr. Stan, Maria, it's a pleasure to see you today. I'm so glad your problem was benign. I'm sure you're going to be fine. Please give me a call in a couple of weeks if you're not feeling better. Gives his business card, educational material, shakes hands, smiles, and exits the exam room. Now, what crucial invest in the end skill did the doctor miss? He missed checking for understanding. And this is something that has to go on throughout the exam. So here's the closed visit. And after the visit, Marie is going, you know, okay, all right, doc, you know. Um, and so after the visit, the doc says, you know, gosh, I think things went great. I gave the correct diagnosis. I reassured it was nothing serious. I gave a reasonable treatment, educational follow-up. I smiled. I think I used very good skills and all in all, it was a good visit. I feel good about it. Then they interviewed Maria. You know, I really think this might be serious. The doctor said it's just muscle spasm, but I'm worried it might be cancer like Uncle Joe had. The doctor told him it was mu muscle sprain. The, the doctor said something about physical therapy and traction and all that stuff, but I didn't pay attention. I couldn't take my mind to worry about the cancer. I wanted to ask the doctor that. I know he's very smart. But to question his diagnosis, that was not my position. I'm just Maria. I'm just like, you know, you know, I work in the dollar store. Who am I to question this doctor? There we go. So let's rewind it and see how it goes. So at this point, instead of, you know, the, the, uh, the proceeding with the physical therapy and the treatment and all that stuff, he stops to check for understanding. So I've explained to you, in my opinion, this is muscle spasm was the cause, but let me check in with you now. Does that seem the way that you look at things too. Uh, you know, I'm still worried, doctor. I, I'm kind of worried about the cancer. They told him it was muscle spasm. Aha, uh -huh. thank you for bringing that up, Maria. Let's go over things again. And now he goes over it again and addresses her concerns. Thank you, I feel so much better. I don't need all, and you know, look at all the time he spent, you know, sending a physical therapy referral, you know, traction, the medicine. She didn't need all that. All she wanted was the reassurance. And, but, but the checking goes on. So, you know, after the doctor makes a diagnosis, does physical therapy work? Would you like to try some medication? Check in at every step. This is the crucial skill. Check for understanding. Um, hmm, let's see. So this is another clip from the doctor. Um, and as you watch this, look at it in terms of the four habits. You know what? I tell you, um, we're kind of running, we're kind of running late. So I'm going to skip this one, actually. Uh, it's, it's a, but there's, like I said, it's a great meeting. So let me give us, let, let's summarize things. Um, the four habits. 
best in the beginning, get patient perspective, express empathy, close the visit. The member habit one, the basics, all these things. Invest in the exam room and your homepage. Invest in your staff. Patient perspective. You know, three great questions. There's a lot more too, but what do you what do you think is wrong? How does this affect your life? What do you fear the most about these symptoms? Habit three, the empathy. Remember empathy statement and shut up. It's the power of the pause. Habit number four, check for understanding at every level. And remember the value of this is patient outcome because if patients, if patients like you, they will connect with you. If they connect with you, they're gonna trust you. If they trust you, they're gonna follow your advice. And if they follow their advice, hopefully they'll have a better outcome. And clinician outcome too. I mean, wow, being able to just, instead of just doing the find it, fix it, here's the medicine type stuff, you know, being able to reassure people about their biggest fears. That's, that has got to bring joy and meaning into, into your professional lives. I know it did with me. And, um, Okay, so that's me. I, you know, um, uh, so many people in neurology, you know, a lot of people come in, you know, and whatever you did, it, it wouldn't help. And so they would always ask me, doctor, do you have a magic wand? So I finally got a magic wand. And so people will come in and uh, I will, you know, tap their head three times with a magic wand and, and say the magic words. And, and then the patient will always ask me, doc, doc, does this work? And then I will say the three magic words, the three magic words, doc, will this work? I say, you never know, you never know. So uh, finally, I don't, Jill, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but um, you know, over the, I worked uh, for many years with uh, communication skills and so forth. And last year, the uh, Covenant Books uh, Took, I, I wrote a lot of uh, articles and stories about communication. Covenant Books published this book um, of my of these vignettes that about communication, and um, uh, that's the book. But I, and that's my that's my email. And I, I know I I think we have maybe about fifty people here that are listening to this. But if you copy down the email and you'd like a copy of the book, I have some, I will send you the first 20 people that email me, I will send you a complimentary copy of the book. But just send me an email with your mailing address. It may take three or four weeks to get there because it's media mail, but um, I'll, I'll send it out to you. So that there we go. That's uh, that ends the presentation. I'm um, really uh, again, like I said, I'm privileged to give this. Uh, talk to uh, an organization that has done so much good in the world, and I really appreciate it. Dr. Abramson, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I'll have you stop the share um, so that you can answer any questions or have a dialogue with anyone. So I just wanted to encourage um, any of the attendees to, if you have any questions for Dr. Abramson, you can feel free to put them via the Q&A icon that's on your Zoom toolbar, or you can post them in the chat if that's easier. Um, or if it's easier to, um, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask it directly. Um, Dr. Abramson, how do we connect with a doctor who is facing burnout or a provider, um, advanced practice um, provider who's facing burnout? I know that's a, a big topic, but... Um, yeah, I mean, that's really kind of like a whole nother talk, but you know what? Um, I, I would um, I would use the four habits, you know, the four habits on those, you know, like, gosh, you know, um, and, and the, you know, patient perspective, you know, tell me, tell me about yourself, first of all, tell me, you know, or, you know, or, uh, what's going on at home, what's doing this, and then to get their perspective, why, why are things going so bad? Why do you think? And then, and then I make some empathy statements and shut up and let, and let someone talk and just let them talk. And I may not have a solution. I mean, I, you know, maybe, maybe there's a solution, you know, maybe you can make suggestions like, oh, you know, cut back to three fifths, uh, cut back to, you know, join another group or whatever, get a new medical assistant. You know, there may be some concrete things, but the most important thing that you can do is to listen to your colleague. And 
be empathic whether you say anything or not with but just just listen great thank you scott any other questions um, for everybody scott i'm going to put your um email in the chat as well um let's see here hold on one second I can't do, I'm not good multitasking and, and typing as well. <laughs> um, okay, put that there. Um, so we will um, have the recording up on the Maven Project website um, by the end of next week. Uh, so that's at mavenproject.org. And then I also put in the chat our upcoming sessions with direct relief. So definitely mark your calendars. The next session in April is on Wednesday, April 26th at 9 a.m. Pacific on hypertension updates in 2023. And then on Wednesday, May 10th, um, 9 a.m. Pacific, long COVID uh, with Dr. Deborah Gold. So please mark your calendars for that. It was really great having this group here today. Um, just a huge appreciation to all of the clinics that are caring for underserved patients for all of you on the front lines that are doing your best every day um, to take care of people, giving them the respect that they need and giving them the care that they need. So I hope that everybody has a wonderful weekend and we look forward to seeing you at our next session and a huge thank you to Direct Relief.